Hello everyone, it's Gwen and welcome to my book talk. The theme for this month's book talk is Ireland. And the first book I'm going to talk to you about is Ancient Ireland from Prehistory to the Middle Ages. This isn't a book that you would read from front to back. It's a coffee table book and I adore those. Uh, it's got a ton of pictures and you can just flip through and spend as much time as you want looking at each one and they're all gorgeous. Uh, I love learning about prehistory and ancient civilizations and this book has a ton of information on that stuff and prehistoric Ireland and the archaeological sites. Um, it doesn't just have archaeological sites, it also has, for example, a picture of bronze age gold jewelry. Let me show you here. Look at that. That was just so pretty. I just love looking at that. I could just spend all my time talking about these pictures. Um, it's possible to pick out my favorite pictures. There are just too many and the photography is just too beautiful. However, I will admit to being especially fond of the picture of a Cranog. Um, a Cranog is like a man-made island built by laying stones in shallow water until they break the surface. And then the stones were covered with brushwood and then covering the brushwood with earth. And then a house was built on this island. Um, they were used as early as the 7th century, if not earlier, and they went on until the 17th century. So if it works, don't fix it. Ah. I just love this picture. It's just so pretty and it's just so cool. Uh, another awesome picture is of Skellig Michael. Named after the Archangel, Skellig Michael is the site of a monastery founded between the 6th and 8th centuries. Um, it has six beehive cells and a church with a graveyard. If it looks familiar, that's because Luke Skywalker spent a few decades hanging out there and avoiding the rest of the galaxy. I'm pretty sure the original monks of Skellig Michael would appreciate that vibe. There are also a bunch of cats, pictures of kept castles and forts. And I'm in love with old places and ruins. Uh, there's this awesome ruin of Adair Castle in County Limerick. Uh, look at this picture. Just, it's a dilapidated, rundown monument to medieval architecture. And when you're thinking of fairy tale castles and knights and ladies, you're thinking of this castle right here. Uh, castle Adair is also referred to as Desmond Castle after the Earls of Desmond who lived there from 1536 to 1584. Located in my ancestral home of County Westmeath is the ruin of Four Abbey. It's a Benedictine monastery. Uh, the Benedictines are the oldest of the Catholic religious orders, and Four Abbey was established in 630 and disestablished in 1539 during the Reformation. It looks like the perfect place for nerds to dress up like elves and role play. And I'm not saying that's what I want to do, but yes, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to go here and I want to role play. Uh, there's not a whole lot of else going on in that particular county of Westmeath, um, which is probably why my people left and the rest of you have, are all stuck with me. Um, but this is just an absolutely beautiful book and it will make you want to buy plane tickets. So now that we've seen some astounding Irish vistas, we're going to talk about some really interesting Irish history. Uh, Malachy McCourt's History of Ireland is not an academic read. This was not written by some stuffy academic in some White Tower or university somewhere. This was written by the guy down at the local pub telling you his favorite bits of Irish history. Seriously, this book covers 2,500 years of history from the arrival of the Celts and the legends of Cuculian, all the way to Bertie, Bertie Ahern and Bono. The British were invited to the island by the traitor Dermot McMurrah in 1167, and they overstayed their welcome by a few centuries. Uh, the Irish, to their credit, which tried repeatedly to kick them out, but the English are stubborn. Um, they did everything they could to divide and subjugate the Irish, um, including pitting the Irish chieftains against each other, implementing tithes that members of one church had to pay to another church, and banning the Irish to try and force everyone to speak English. Um, these and many, many other poor management practices 
had the effect of dividing Ireland and creating centuries of a devastated economy and strife. Uh, infuriatingly, when the English could have interfered for the better, they just made a few paltry donations and otherwise did nothing to interfere with the starvation and evictions of poor tenants during the Great Famine. Um, one of my favorite people from Irish history is Charles Stuart Parnell. He was elected as a member of parliament in 1875, and he was soon noticed by the Fenians and the Irish Brotherhood, organizations dedicated to the establishment of an independent Irish Republic. Uh, Parnell worked for Irish independence as a member of the government, and in a time of rising evictions and hunger, he cultivated relationships in Ireland and among the Irish Americans and their organizations overseas. Uh, the funds he raised in America provided relief for the starving Irish, and he supported the Land League, which worked to abolish landlords and allow tenants to, uh, to own the land that they worked. He was also jailed for sedition and his release was negotiated by his mistress's husband. I would love to know more about that relationship. I don't really have the time I want to devote to the uncrowned King of Ireland. Um, he was just so energetic and so devoted to the cause of Irish home rule. He wasn't afraid to be politically expedient and he was personally complex and enigmatic. Uh, the main reason I appreciate him is that he worked for people who did not share his demographics. He was a wealthy Protestant landowner and he worked to improve the conditions and lives of poor Catholic tenant farmers. William Gladstone, the prime minister of the United Kingdom at the time said that if Parnell had not been brought low by the scandal of his affair and his mistress, he would have brought home rule to Ireland. Uh, and just to end on a lighter note, the book spends a few pages on Bono and includes an origin story for his name, which is a ton of fun to read. There are several stories as to the origin of Bono's name, the most common being that is from the words Bono Vox. Now, it would be very nice and neat if this name, Latin for good voice, had clairvoyantly been conferred on the future rock singer. But the more mundane truth is that he and his friends used to hang around a store on O'Connell Street that sell that used to sell Bono Vox hearing aids. And boys being boys, the name looked good, and so they christened your man. Hardly a romantic, fate-filled story, but there you have it. He was named after a brand of hearing aids. I told you this was not written by an academic. This is written by a dude telling you his favorite parts of Irish history, and it, it's a hoot. I don't even care if that story is true or not, and that. It's a good story, and that's what's important. So you can't talk about Ireland without mentioning her poets and bards. Our final book is the new Oxford book of Irish verse edited with translations by Thomas Kinsella. Uh, starting with poetry from the 6th century and going on through the 20th century, and this book spans the spectrum of poetry in terms of themes and tone and gives numerous examples of Irish voice throughout history. A lot of the poetry, especially in the early centuries, is religious in nature. There are pleas to God for mercy and stories and verses of the saints, particularly Patrick and Colum Kiel. Mary is frequently referenced and invoked for help. The best bits of religious poetry are the ones that were written for Christians by Christians. Many times we came in, we took the older bits of poetry and legends and we sort of slapped on a Christian veneer or added an additional stanza to make it Christian. Um, what that does is that the poetry then tries to unite two worlds that don't always mesh harmoniously and it's a bit jarring. Uh, when we wrote our own poetry, the poem's themes flow more smoothly and you can tell that they mean something to the author and to the audience. There is also love poetry, and it's really interesting to see that some things never change. For example, there's this one dude who goes, it is far for just, from just between us, myself and my beloved, myself all eagerness and she without much interest. Yeah, here we have a 15th or 16th century man refusing to accept that his crush just isn't into him. He was probably really irritating. Um, but we can move on through the centuries. Ireland's poems touched on various political realities of their day. So one poem dating back to 1798 contains this stanza. And if the color we must wear is England's cruel red, 
let it remind us of the blood that Ireland has shed. Then pull the shamrock from your hat and throw it on the sod and never fear it will take root there, though underfoot is trod. I actually made that into a, into a song that you can look it up on YouTube if you want to hear it. W.B. W. B. Yeats also does this. He touches on the political realities of his day. And you can't talk about Irish poetry and not mention Yeats. So one part of his Easter 1916 poem goes, too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part, our part, to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. Several other poems in the book have been turned into songs by various artists. And you can find them on our Freegal app, which you can access through the library website. Irish music is incredibly haunting and atmospheric. Uh, if you go on Freegal, I recommend the High Kings. So that is my book talk on Ireland. And once again, those books are Ancient Ireland from Prehistory to the Middle Ages. Malachi McCourt's History of Ireland. And the new Oxford Book of Irish Verse, edited with translations by Thomas Kinsella. And you can find them all at Spartanburg County Public Library.